Hello and welcome to the first ever bunch of videos where I'm going to be watching Pixar movies and doing my thoughts on them because, I don't know man, I've got Disney Plus, I might as well make use of it and, and watch some of the fucking movies they've made over the years. Um, as you can just tell, this is not going to be the kind of thing where I'm like, this is made for kids. No, this is this is a 26 year old's perspective. Um, and I haven't watched a movie yet, but the movie we're watching, as you can probably tell by the thumbnail, is Toy Story. I'm going by the um, category Pixar through the years, which is basically um, the idea of this series. We're going to be watching the movies, the movies in chronological order. Um, I'm going to be skipping the shorts. I might do a video where I go back and watch all the shorts and, and do my thoughts on them, but we're going to be skipping the shorts. We're just going to be doing the main movies. And before we get stuck in, I'll say that Toy Story is a movie I've seen before, but I haven't seen it in about 20 years. Um, probably a bit more than 20 years, actually. Um, but the Pixar movies I've seen include stuff like Toy Story 1 and 2, um, Finding Nemo, Cars, um, I have not seen Monsters Inc, or if I have, it's too old for me to remember. I think the earliest one I ever saw was A Bug's Life, actually, because I, I barely remember anything about A Bug's Life. But yeah, I'm not quite sure how this is going to translate into a video. It might be 10 minutes long where I'm just like, yep, that was a kid's film. Or it might be like half an hour where I'm like, oh, I want to talk about this and this and this and this. I don't know how much content I can get out of this movie, but we're going to find out. So uh, I'm going to go watch the movie and you're going to wait less than a second to hear my thoughts on it. Let's go. <laughs> That fucking soundtrack cut straight through me to the childhood. It hit me straight in the childhood. Probably mostly because of a PlayStation 1 Toy Story game I used to play as a kid. I would technically have heard that opening theme many times every time I booted that game up, whereas I would have only seen the movie a few times. But that's it. That's the sound of Toy Story right there. It's the sound of childhood. So the first thing I want to talk about is what's most immediately apparent when watching the film, which is the visuals. How has the 3D CGI held up? Because this, this movie... It is as old as I am. It came out in 1995, and so did I. That was gross. Why did I say it that way? And yeah, I won't lie, the visuals have aged a bit. The lighting's a little bit wonky. The physics don't quite work all the time the way you would expect them to. There's a little bit of uncanny valley in there, but I guess that's kind of a wrong way of saying it, because at no point did I look at someone apart from maybe the kids' faces uh, and go, huh, that's weird. Um, but there were definitely a few things that stuck out to me as being slightly janky, slightly jarring, um, but in terms of raw graphics of what I'm looking at, I would say it's kind of on par with PlayStation 3 graphics and of course I'm going to relate it back to video games because uh, if you consider the fact that I've been around since 1995 and that I'm a gamer, um, I have seen technology evolve most uh, prominently through gaming and how graphics have evolved. So. Uh, that's probably how I'm going to be referring to stuff like that, or comparing stuff like that, I should say. But yeah, it reminded me of the kind of graphics you might see in a game like Ratchet & Clank Tools of Destruction, you know? And I think it is fair to compare um, pre-rendered movie graphics to kind of like video game console graphics of a later era, because video game console graphics um, are doing it on the fly, so obviously there's more work being done there. Um, and we're just now getting to the point where we can make stuff look so damn good um, that you can go back and watch all the behind the scenes stuff of the Disney Pixar movies about how they would have to spend hours and hours and hours rendering each scene and you can compare that to how games which look as good as those scenes run in real time and you kind of get an understanding of how far technology has come since then. But that's not necessarily relevant right now, is it? The visuals might have aged a little bit, but when you consider that they were made in 1995, it's bloody phenomenal what it is. I could show this film to my nieces and they probably wouldn't say a word about, oh, is this an older film? Was this made like before I was born or something? I don't know. Like, I don't think they would say that. I don't think they'd notice. Maybe they'd think it was slightly cheaper or something. I don't know. Not just that, but um, even for what it is graphically in terms of the world building and like the attention to detail, they are so on it. Like there are scuff marks on corners of doors and stuff which would have been kicked shut instead of shut properly because it's you know shut by a kid because it's his bedroom door the the skirting boards have scuffs on them from when like boots have hit them and stuff like that like this is the first feature length toy story uh, first feature length pixar movie and it's so full of little details that most people might not even notice. The only reason I even knew to look for it was because I recently listened to a podcast where someone happened to talk about how there's a level of attention to detail in Monsters, Inc. Um, that they wouldn't even think to, you know, put in themselves because 
you know, you take it for granted when you see it in real life. You don't look at a skirting board and go, oh, that skirting board is a little bit scuffed. It's, it just is. You don't care about it. But when it's left out of a movie, you know, it might be something you notice or it might not. But when it's included in the movie, it adds a sense of presence and reality. And it just goes to show how much care and work and effort was put into this movie. I'm not saying scuff marks are the reason why Disney Pixar is so successful, but you know. Although I guess it wasn't Disney Pixar back then, was it? It was just straight up Pixar. Now I did take notes here, so I'm going to be talking about some things that stood out to me as I watched through the movie. At one point, Mr. Potato Head calls Piggy Bank, or whatever his name is, uh, he says, you uncultured swine. That is a phrase that I have said, and I wonder if I picked it up from Toy Story, or whether it's just a phrase and Toy Story included it. Rabbit in the egg. <laughs> Rabbit in the egg? Chicken in the egg situation. Oh no, I don't know how animals work. There's a joke where Woody's doing kind of like a, 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 a oh fucking hell, what are they called? You know the thing that cowboys do when they do like 10 paces and say draw and turn around and shoot each other? There was a joke where Woody did that with the Etch-a-Sketch and the Etch-a-Sketch literally drew a gun and it literally made me laugh. So the humour is here and um, I was happy to notice because you remember I said before I watched the movie I wasn't sure if I was personally going to get anything out of it from a 26 year old perspective. Happy to announce that yes, I enjoyed the movie. I should probably have led with that. Um, there were jokes in it that made me chuckle. I, I didn't outright laugh or anything, but there were jokes that made me chuckle. Um, the story, as rudimentary as it was, was very effective in what it did, which I'll be getting into in a moment, and um, I, yeah, I enjoyed it. Something that, that stood out to me was when Woody was talking at the start of a movie about how they were moving in a week, and everyone had to find a moving buddy so that nobody would get lost on the way there. I realised that's a little bit of foreshadowing, and you could say that Buzz Lightyear turned out to be Woody's moving buddy. Huh? That's why you watch these videos, because I come with a hot-hitting takes that nobody else thinks of. Fucking deep dive into some narrative right here. Something else I noticed was that Mr. Potato Head was hoping for a Mrs. Potato Head, which is funny considering the relationship they have in Toy Story 2 and, uh, assumedly onwards, I've not seen 3 or 4. Which also brings me to another point, the only female representation we really see in this movie is Lil Bo Peep, who is extremely stereotypical, uh, is Legs, I guess you could say, who is literally a pair of walking sexy toy legs, which is, I guess, that's what that is, um, and I guess Andy's mom, that's about it, that's all the female representation there is. I know it's 1995 and they probably do better now, but I felt like that was worth pointing out. But hey, Bo Peep did take control of a situation at the end of a movie when she wanted to shower Woody with kisses. Not enough really, is it? And I know inevitably there will be people watching this going, come on Christian, do you really have to dissect a, you know, 26 year old kids movie for feminism and stuff like that but it is important because kids grow up with this stuff and it gets ingrained in them and girls need to be able to watch a movie and see female superheroes there too who do stuff in the story and aren't just relegated to oh and I guess you got Sid's sister as well Eh, she was alright. She scared him with her doll in the end. That was pretty cool. But yes, anyway, moving on. I did take note of the fact that Woody uh, represents, um, at the start of a movie, the kind of things Andy's into. So he's, you know, a cowboy. Uh, his bedroom is decorated in a kind of a cowboy theme. He's interested in the Old West. Uh, that's what he's into. And then, of course, the big changing point in the story is Buzz Lightyear comes along and suddenly he's interested in the spaceman and he wants his room to be decorated with space-themed stuff. And I think that's really clever um, because it kind of it's kind of a running theme in the movie that the characters, or I guess mostly Woody, are scared of change. And what better way to show change than to have the character who's literally stuck in the past being threatened by a character who hails from the future nice touch. And if there are any themes that can be found in this movie, I have to say it's change, jealousy, and then guilt as well. Guilt's a major factor in, I guess this is all Woody related themes, but it's a major factor in um, his character development and how he changes going forwards in a movie. One of the earliest Woody and Buzz interactions that I really liked was... I need to repair my turbo boosters. Do people still use fossil fuels or have you discovered crystallic fusion? Well, let's see. Uh, we got double A's. The dialogue in this movie is surprisingly fast and witty and I found myself smiling at it quite often. Or chuckling, as I said earlier. I'm not downgrading it, don't worry. I also wrote down here that um, before we meet Sid, Woody's kind of the antagonist of a movie. Like, his jealousy overcomes him and most of the cast are kind of getting annoyed at him about it. It's interesting because I feel like in a lot of children oriented films you don't get that kind of depth in a character. As, like, okay, maybe it's more of a modern thing. Take a look at the earlier Ratchet and Clank games, um, specifically the first one. Ratchet's very similar um, in how he's not always the most likable character, but as he grows as a character he overcomes that kind of those kind of negative character traits and changes. Whereas in most of the modern Ratchet and Clank games, it's just very clear-cut, 
two best friends on an adventure and i don't know i feel like i feel like we kind of treat kids a little bit too unfairly when it comes to their comprehension of understanding what's bad about a character and how they can grow in a movie or a game but then again i haven't watched every single goddamn kids film that's come out over the last 20 years so maybe that's just a thing that i've made up in my head that's the second time i've cited ratchet and clank in this video isn't it sorry huge fan of course as you probably already know it is a good comparison though because ratchet and clank's one of those series that kind of tries to mirror disney in many ways just with a touch more you know cheekiness i pegged that the uh the moving company that they're using is called virtual reality which is probably a nod to the fact that this is all happening in a virtual reality. I uh, remember that this movie was made before VR as a video game thing was ever, you know, conceived. Or, I mean, it was conceived in science fiction, but not not done properly. One thing I noticed about Buzz Lightyear, by the way, in comparison to Woody's jealousy, Buzz is extremely naive. Like, the amount of times that he cottons onto the fact that Woody doesn't like him and that he constantly messes with him and then still gets, you know, tricked by Woody lying to him about something is kind of, you know, kind of embarrassing for a spaceman who, you know, is super smart and knows how to fly and stuff. Just saying, Buzz. Just saying. Hey, guys, look! It's the real Buzz Lightyear! You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh, no, 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 no. Buzz, look, an alien! Where? Ah! But I guess you can't really have uh, Woody's jealousy and anger turning him uh, into a pseudo-antagonist without the naive buzz there to be led astray. Another little touch I liked is when they get lost and they end up in the petrol station, or sorry, the gas station, and they go to uh, take refuge in a truck that's going to where Andy's going. Buzz talks about how they need to, they need to strap themselves in. And Woody's like, what? Get in the cockpit? Strap, strap yourself in? No, that's dumb. Why would I need to do that? And it's a little nod to the fact that Buzz knows more about technology than Woody does being of the future. Cowboy ass Woody hasn't been in a car before. I mean, he has because he's been with Andy, but that's that's not really that deep of a thing that they're trying to do. I just liked it. I like the uh, toy grabbing machine with the aliens because that clearly feels like a thing they did where they were in the arcade and they were like, wait a minute. Uh, toy grabbing machines are a thing. If toys are sentient in this universe, how does that work in Toy Story? And of course you have the aliens who revere the claw as something that comes and takes them to like divine ascension or something. The claw. Everyone loves those little fuckers, don't they? When Sid found Woody and Buzz in a claw machine and stole them and took them home on a skateboard, there is a scene where he's skateboarding back to his house and because skateboards are so physics based, the bad physics really stood out to me and that scene, even though it was only a couple of seconds long, looked really janky to me. I just wanted to point that out as like a little bit of like, oh, if you want to see where the movie shows its age, go to that point. So we get to Sid's room. And there's a lot to unpack here. Once again, I love that this clearly came up in the story making decisions, like how in a world where toys are sentient, how do you handle a kid who has issues and mistreats his toys? And how do you do that in a kid's movie? And the answer for that second question is, we don't hold back apparently. The first time we are introduced to Sid's room and his toys as they kind of circle in on toy and on toy on Woody and Buzz is legitimately creepy. And I'm not sure that's something that they would go as hard on in the modern day like again i was saying how modern kids movies aren't quite as dark um i again i haven't watched every modern day kids movie so this could just be a old man shakes his fist at corporations thing but i don't think they do i think they they molly coddle these damn kids but yeah these are these are toys which have been mashed up they've got heads on the wrong bodies they've got uh, the scary looking instruments around like painful looking instruments around like Obviously these are toys, but these are toys which have been humanized to us over the last hour and we we kind of see those things as more of torture instruments than of toy modifiable things. Patient is prepped. No one's ever attempted a double bypass brain transplant before. Now for the tricky part. Players! I don't believe that man's ever been to medical school. <laughs> I've seen some takes on the internet in recent years where people have said that Sid wasn't such a bad guy, that he showed more expression of he wanted toys to be different instead of just accepting them as they were off the shelves and Sid's really cool because of that. I don't think the movie tries to do that at all here. I think, um, I guess you could make an argument for that, but I think it would be going against the story that the movie is quite clearly trying to tell. However, I did love the message that the movie very clearly was going for, which was to challenge your assumptions because when Sid leaves the room, and I think a few scenes pass and it's about 10 or 20 minutes later, um, we learn that the, the toys, the very scary looking toys, 
are actually really friendly and they fix Buzz up when he loses his arm and they help Woody out when he's trying to save Buzz later on uh, and they gang up on Sid and all that kind of thing and I think that is a very important and heartfelt and special message that this movie does very well. Don't judge based on appearances. And again you might be like oh come on Christian it's not that important but again remember when you're a kid you take everything you see for granted as absolute truth. I know I did. And it's important that you have movies like that which show people these things, that show kids these things. Subversion of expectation for us adults can be a little bit eye-rolly when done wrong, or it can be a little bit, huh, when done right. Uh, but as a kid, it's like, whoa, the spider-headed dude was a good guy, that's crazy. Hmm, maybe I should challenge my assumptions. Okay, <laughs> it's not quite like that. One other moment of the visuals not aging well in this movie I pegged was, um, I keep, <laughs> I gotta stop saying pegged, it does not mean what it used to mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One thing I picked up on was the dog's eyes. Did you notice the dog's eyes? They're the wrong shape, they look a bit weird, the eyes behave weirdly in the head and you kind of get the impression that there's just one big gooey eyeball with two pupils on the inside of that head and it's it's it doesn't look right and it makes the dog look super weird and creepy and I don't like it. And you could argue that the dog's supposed to look super creepy and weird and I, I don't think it's supposed to look creepy, I think it's supposed to look intimidating but you know, there, there's that. The scene where Buzz finally learns that he is indeed a toy uh, by seeing the advert uh, on a TV for the Buzz Lightyear toy, that's done really well. And then the subsequent scene where Woody tells him that, no, I've not been saying that, I mean, this isn't what he says, but essentially I'm not saying that you're just a toy, I'm saying that you are a toy, and you're Andy's toy, and he needs you. And then the turn of character, it's a really good moment. It's really well done. Of course it is. It's the fucking Toy Story Pixar movie. Of course it's well done. Is anyone surprised? But again, this movie just has a really good message about embracing who you are as well. Uh, like, hey, maybe you're not a superhero that you want to be, uh, that you've been seeing on TV, or that you were led to believe that you are, but you still are special to someone close to you. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez, I just gave myself goosebumps. Oh, and before we move on from Sid, I did notice that his bed frame literally has barbed wire attached to the head of it, which has got to be dangerous. What if, what if you sit up too fast when you're asleep or something? Good God. And then one final thing I want to say um, when it comes down to, you know, people like to dive into the lore of Pixar movies and try and establish them all together and imagine what the wider world would be like if all of these things that these movies are telling us are true. Um, which, of course, is a very adult thing to do. You want to find more from these movies than what it gives you because it's aimed at children and not adults. Um, but something that is mentioned is that when Woody's trying to mount the rescue attempt on um, Buzz and he's telling the other toys about how they're going to have to break a few rules um, to get this done, by which he means reveal themselves to Sid as being sentient and spooking him by being like, oh, we know who you are, Sid, you should be nicer to your toys until he runs off screaming. That's apparently breaking a few rules. And I have to ask, who makes those rules? And more importantly, what is the fear of breaking them? Who enforces these rules? What is going on. Now of course it's quite clearly not meant to be taken quite so seriously. There's no hint at a larger world here of a sentient toy police force or something like that. Um, but it is fun to speculate, isn't it? Because art belongs to those who uh, enjoy it and not the people who made it. And it doesn't matter what the creator intended. If that's in there, uh, it doesn't have to meaningfully hint. At, at something like that. It does hint at something like that and it does beg the question, well then what what does that mean? Sorry I didn't mean to get into death of the author territory with fucking Toy Story but here we are I guess. I didn't write any notes from here on out for the final act of the movie, uh, partially because I was devouring my tasty Chinese uh, meal but partially because there's just not a whole lot to say. It's the culmination of a relationship of Woody and Buzz finally uh, becoming friends and working together to get back to Andy as he's moving house. It's an action sequence, it's done well, lots of things pay off, like the rocket strapped on his back, that's the, kind of Chekhov's gun in a way because it's strapped onto his back for quite a while, uh, which they use there. Uh, one criticism I do have with the movie is how quick Woody's friends are to sell him out. Um, and obviously it's because there's a miscommunication, they believe he, uh, for all intents and purposes, murdered Buzz Lightyear, um, but if they're really as shocked and horrified and betrayed as that, um, <laughs> I mean it's a kid's movie. It's a Christian, it's a kid's movie, let it go. All I'm saying is, it didn't go far enough one way or the other. They didn't, like, not care that Buzz had been pushed out a window and that Woody had apparently betrayed him, uh, but at the same time they weren't 
mourning the loss of Buzz uh, to the point where when Woody's trying to catch up to them, uh, they're not like, oh, oh God, he's coming back to murder. They're just like, oh, it's Woody. Get out of here, Woody. Even though he's been their friend for years. Again, it's a kid's movie. I shouldn't be taking this, this seriously. I'm sorry, but I can't stop my brain from working like this. Either way, toys catch up. Everyone lives happily ever after. It's genuinely nice. Um, I think the reason I enjoy it so much is because as an adult you watch so many movies which don't have happy endings because subversion of expectation is important and if every movie had a happy ending then you would just expect it. Um, but it's nice isn't it just to be like ah oh, look they all made it back and here they are at Christmas and there's new things happening and they're all together and they're friends and it's great and I needed that. I'm a 26 year old man and I needed the end of Toy Story tonight so thank you Toy Story um, and thank you for listening to 20 minutes of a 26 year old man talk about a movie made for five year olds. It's interesting to watch isn't it? And I guess it's not necessarily made for five year olds. It is a family movie. It is a movie for all ages. I mean they make a couple of jokes with allusions to adult connotations that kids are clearly gonna miss but obviously they're there for the adults. The Spongebob Squarepants effect my dad would call it which makes it fun to watch even when you're an adult or you know it's nice to pick up on things you may have missed as a kid um so yeah there's that. I will be doing the next Pixar movie which what is the next Pixar movie? A Bug's Life! I genuinely thought it was Toy Story 2 that's after Bug's Life so Next time, uh, I'm going to be aiming to do these within about a week of each other, but um, I'm, I've got a week off at the minute. I'm not always going to have as much time to throw away on a movie as I might do now, but I'm going to aim for at least a week or two apart with these videos. So come back soon for Thoughts on a Bug's Life, which I've definitely not seen in upwards of 23, 24 years, uh, and I will see you then.